what's happening in the industry. And I talk a lot about fixed pricing and no billable hours, but I really want people to know that I, I'm putting my money where my mouth is. And it's important for the industry to know what I stand for and what we're doing. And the fact that we don't want to look different, we want to be different. And you can have a different experience with me as your lawyer and with us as your firm. So here's what I have to say. Okay. Yes, here I am. <laughs> Jimmy Benizri from the Legal Logic. So a little bit about me. I had a lot of interests when I was in school and I didn't really know what I wanted to do. And luckily for me, I followed my now wife uh, to McGill in physiology, thinking that I maybe wanted to be a doctor. She was much smarter than me. She ended up going, going up to going to medical school. My grades were always very average, um, but I always compensated by a lot of different hobbies. I took my student loans and reinvested into real estate, leveraged that. I had started some companies and sold it. I had worked as a waiter on the weekends, um, really because I, I had a passion for business. I had a passion uh, for human interaction, and I really liked learning. I hated every degree that I did, but I really enjoyed learning. So physiology was as dry as it gets. Interaction of cells. That's pretty much all I remember from my bachelor's, but I think cells interact <laughs> somehow. I, think, I remember a word, a word called mitochondria at one point. I think that's a thing, uh, but super technical. And although I couldn't relate to it, I loved learning and I loved being in school. But more importantly, I love this concept of community and being around um, you know, community like this and sharing stories and experiences. And a lot of my friends today come from, from that kind of setting. I had a great conversation with some, uh, with some students outside, and they're like, well, how did you, you know, get into law? And I'm like, it was really accidental. And what happened was that um, I was selling a business that I had started, I had made some applications, and instead of you know, checking medical school, school, I actually checked law school. And I forgot that I had applied, and my mom, you know, when I was you know, living at home, said, hey, you got this package from Sherbrooke University, and I, didn't, I hadn't remembered applying there. And I opened it, and, and I was accepted to law school. <laughs> and, uh, and I never thought of myself as a lawyer. Um, I like you know, Law and Order like, like anyone else. Uh, does anyone of your generation even watch Law and Order? Or is it only Suits now? It's only Suits, I'm sorry. Suits? Suits, yeah. yeah. But I, me and my mother drove to Sherbrooke. I got an apartment. We cleaned my apartment. And I started law school. Because I was interested. It was my second bachelor's. And that's really, uh, it was really serendipity. And, I'm, I'm, and you'll understand as we walk through a little bit about what I've tried to create and what I've tried to do in my industry, um, I'm really passionate about business and about relationships and about communities. And that's kind of what I wanted to explore, you know, going into uh, law school. I graduated, came back to Montreal, and I was a prosecutor for the, uh, the city of Montreal. I was also doing all kinds of different law. I was doing, I was incorporating companies. I was divorcing people. I was, you know, uh, I was you know, suing, suing people for, for un you know, unpaid, unpaid you know, debt and claims and credit, and I was doing everything. I was sending, and I remember this so vividly, I'm sitting in my office, and the secretary brings me all the clients that I was working on as a, as a junior attorney, and nobody was paying the bills that I was sending out. Nobody. So we had a meeting with my, with my superiors, and they're like, well, what the hell's going on? What are you, what are you sending out? Like, what is, what's going on? I'm like, I don't know. I'm doing the work, sending out the invoice, just like I, I'm supposed to, but I'm losing relationships. Clients are leaving elsewhere. Uh, uh, people are not necessarily paying. People are negotiating the fees that I you know, thought were, were, uh, were coming to me. And that's when I realized that this, this this friction, the pressure between the lawyer and the client was so not conducive to my personality, to the way the industry was set up. And I just, I wanted something different. You know, we come in, unfortunately, a lot of us as we graduate, we come into the, we come into the industry with a sense of entitlement, with a sense of what we think we're worth, but we're really not, you know, we're at the point, I think, uh, in the economy where um, you really have to prove yourself. It's not coming to us. It wasn't coming to me. And I think the clarity and the scope of what I was doing at that point was not clear. And it hit me like a ton of bricks as I realized that I wasn't preserving the relationship and I wasn't being relational. I was being transactional. I was sending out these bills 
in the anticipation of what I thought I was worth, and it wasn't working for me. It wasn't what I wanted. The legal model for me was incongruent with the way that entrepreneurs and people were expecting to be served. And, wrong way. I just closed the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> and that's my story. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so, you know, and, and, and it kind of reminds, you know, as all this was happening, as all, all this was brewing, uh, I was representing a client who came to see me. She'd just gone through uh, a surgery for her fallopian tubes. And when she finished the surgery, she had pains and she went back and got checked up on and an x-rays revealed that while she was opened up, not only did the doctor remove the fallopian tubes, but also removed her ovaries. Uh, because he thought that that was the right thing to do. At that time, it was not in the prep, it was not in contemplated in any discussion. And, you know, it, it, it became almost for me, it, that it happened at such a, such a crucial time in my career. And it's almost as if that one event, you know, made me realize the way that the doctor treated the patient was the way I felt at that time, like I was treating my own clients. You think you're coming in for something, and without the clarity of what the lawyer is doing, you know, he's billing for this, and he's billing for that, and he's doing work that you don't necessarily understand, or that you signed up for. Which is why, for me, a defining moment in um, what I wanted to do is bring clarity and scope to every single mandate. Fixing fees and really innovating by launching a law firm that wasn't the gatekeeper of information, the law firm that was unlocking this content machine. And there's so much content around me that I wanted to be the purveyor or the reference point for um, legal services. So I wanted entrepreneurs to click on a YouTube video or a guide before incorporating. I wanted people to read a guide um, you know, before they sue a doctor or think that they're entitled to compensation. Okay, and I really think that, you know, a lot of people talk about, you know, you know, Gary Vee and all these guys that are putting up content. And, you know, the interesting thing, and, you know, like you said, you know, givers, um, you know, when you give, it comes back to you. And we do a lot of networking, and, you know, the, the credo of BNI is givers gain. The more you give, the more you gain. And, you know, this sense of altruism in business uh, does have merit. And I, and I, and I think that, you know, all, all three of us really are, are a testament to that. So I want it to be accessible, I, I didn't want it to be a barrier. I needed to try to find a way to break down billing. And how do I make money doing this? And I spent the last five years racking my brain trying to build a scalable model. And I got my ass kicked in 2017 because I scaled too far, too fast, and too wildly without any plan. And I'll tell you about that a little bit later. But this is our mission. It's long. I got to shorten it. We won awards. We were on the map. And what happens is that when things like this happen, it doesn't mean that I was rolling in cash. It just means that I was still in a ton of debt and I was over leveraged, and they, but things started happening. And I think that's the message of today is to be consistent. Eventually you're gonna make money in a way that you're happy getting up in the morning and being passionate about something that you wanna to do to make the world a better, big, a better place like uh, Mr. Bulos talked about. So fixed pricing, innovative online models. I wasn't the Che Guevara of law. I was a guy who was bringing basic tech tools and strategies to the, old, the oldest ass industry that we've ever known. Fucking Aristotle was billing by the hour. <laughs> Whenever the hell Aristotle existed. It doesn't make sense that we can allow ourselves to continue in this way in such a massive market. So I was doing no fee business corporations. I said, I'm not even gonna I'm not even gonna compete on, 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 on price. I'll give it to you for free. Just pay my costs. Just to show how different we were at that time. We were doing startup packages and trademarking and we were scaling and things were really fun. So we offered all this. We opened our scope and you know, we, we, I thought I was opening a business boutique law firm but what happened is that I can't control all the crazies that come through my door. So I was doing litigation and I was doing divorces and I was divorcing people who had met their uh, loved ones in Cuba and were sponsoring them to come back to Montreal. I was doing all that because I had to pay the bills. 
and it was kind of fun. <laughs> but I really, you know, what, what I thought I was signing up for wasn't necessarily what put me on the map and what allowed me to scale or go back to what is core for me as a legal practitioner. So yeah, we've been in the news, a lot of, you know, you know when, you're, when you're looking to create a niche for yourself in the market, and you guys really touched on this, you know, with Juniper and everything, and, you know, with you for sure, is you need to stand out. Don't be obnoxious about it. Don't be fake about it, but find that inner voice, reach down, and pull it out big time. Because you gotta stand out, okay? In a way that makes sense, that's responsible. So we went up against the big boys. You know, we were, I was taking cases that people didn't wanna, that, that other firms didn't wanna be associated with. And that's really what put us on the map as being, you know, not, even, not only a firm that's innovating in legal media, but also a firm that's actually results driven and that's not afraid to actually be creative in you know, what's, what's technically my, you know, my industry. So my challenge, my challenge is, and I think, you know, um, um, I, I think uh, my colleague had three circles, one of them was, was culture. Culture is the biggest bitch. It's fickle, it's faint, it's so easy to lose. Culture needs to be nurtured like a delicate flower. What's your favorite flower? Lily. Lily. It needs to be fostered and nurtured like a lily. <laughs> and I'm testament to this. In 2017, I was not around as much. I was, you know, I was at court. I was doing business development. We had offices in Saguenay and in Quebec City. And the culture suffered. The culture suffered because I wasn't there because there was no one there to drive, not that, that my team was incompetent, but the, the guy who brought the ship out wasn't there as a constant reminder uh, and a symbolic kind of reminder of you know, where we were supposed to be going and the energy that we wanted to have and the ambiance that really put us on the map as a great place to work. I kind of lost the sense of that, not because I wanted to, not because I didn't want to spend time with my team, but because I was trying to scale. And I think there's a time for that. But, you know, being an entrepreneur and a lawyer is almost an oxymoron because I'm wearing this really super technical hat where yesterday I was, you know, I was, you know, talking about legislation from 1963 that dealt with my grandfather's wooden shoes. When, you know, it's so technically um, technical. <laughs> and it's incongruent with the role of a leader, an entrepreneur, whose macro vision, who's, who's kind of really, he's got the bird's eye view of what's happening. And it's been really hard for me to reconcile that. And that's why I'm up at 4 a.m. And that's why I, I go to sleep at, tw at midnight or, you know, 12, 15. And this is kind of what, what, what keeps me going. That I love the mission, I love what we're, we've embarked on. Um, but it's really, for me, it's, it's been really hard to reconcile that. Um, so, this is playing off of my laptop, and I don't think we'll be able to hear it. So this brings me to um, fixed price, fixed billing. Okay, the industry, um, like I said from the beginning, didn't feel comfortable with me, and the way that I, the, my response to that, the Jamie Benizri approach of how I'm going to leave this world better, is to bang on the drum of fixed. Pricing, whether it's a form of percentage, whether I tell you it's going to cost you five grand and you can pay me in installments on you know monthly, clients need to know what they're getting into, and lawyers are notorious for never giving an answer. How much is it going to cost me? Isn't it beautiful outside? <laughs> Let's go for a walk. Sign the mandate. Yeah, but how much is it going to cost me? Do you want to come for dinner tonight? So it needs to be clear from the beginning, and it's something that I've really tried hard to in terms of you know, you know, having that scope creep where things are really um, clear and people know what they're getting involved with. So I, I declared RIP, rest in peace, free consultations. And my model also going forward was that um, you know, we, had a great, we had a great conversation. For, we spoke 30 seconds and we caught up. Uh, that's all we needed really because you know, we, we understand each other. But, you were saying that there was a guy, a marketer named Tim, back in the day, who said that the hourly model, you know, cheapens us. If I spend 15 minutes, as you said, on a mandate, 
Does that mean I'm not entitled to charge my full rate? I can only charge them thirty dollars versus something I spent twenty hours on. So the model, and because I'm involved in a lot of you know social impact businesses, the, the model was free consultations. The it's up to the discretion of the client to contribute whatever they want, and a portion from all, all proceeds are earmarked for um, uh, charities, local charities that we're a part of. So for me, this was um, a huge shift as well to monetize and put value on an otherwise uh, untapped um, stream of income that I think deserve, that, I, that I deserve to tap into. So I talk a lot about start. I don't want to take up too much time, so you guys just cut me off like whenever. I want to make sure that there's enough time for q and I'm going to speed this up. Um, Startup for me is a term that's thrown around a lot. It's sometimes abused, um, but at the at the end of the day, I'm still a startup five years later. Even if we have revenue, 30 employees, um, whatever, um, and I've really identified five qualities for a startup that I think need to exist not only in brand new companies but companies that are going to stand the test of time. The GEs that have weathered you know generations and depressions and the Kellogg's and the Legos who have redefined themselves, they're paranoid on the market, they're always looking over their shoulder. Startups are always looking over their shoulder. They're grateful, they recognize the value, they give. Sense of community is huge. And, I, and, and they're fast. Speed of execution is what's gonna differentiate your startup, your business, and if you can bring that to the table, it's a huge game changer. They're visionary. There needs to be a vision in place that people are actually going to you know, follow. There needs to be that consistent vision and it needs to be decentralized so people are actually empowered to make decisions. So my tips, focus on the long term. So Mr. Boulos is right. You will make money doing what you love, but it's gonna take time. It takes a long time. Unless you're like Justin, you hit it big in the crypto market, and now you're a crypto billionaire. <laughs> Are you a crypto billionaire? Not yet. Okay. <laughs> Not even invested. Um, but those are rare. Don't focus on that shit. <laughs> you know, forget the Ty Lopez, who's just eating up your fucking news feed with pizzas that he bought with crypto and Ferraris and all that crap. <laughs> Drive your mother's minivan from 2002 and keep your head down. And eventually it's gonna connect, and when it connects, it's gonna connect big, okay? It's a marathon. Any profession is a marathon, and you're only as good as your reputation. And it's so easy to lose your reputation. It's so easy. And as you mentioned, do something that you're happy with, because if you don't, it's so not worth it. You know, your mother will let you come back home for a couple years if you're not happy in your industry. Okay? If you're, if you're bringing your wife and kids and it's like, you know, full house, Uncle Jesse style, it may be weird, so don't take advantage of that, but, you know, your mother's going to take care of you, so don't worry about it. All right, you can move in with Mr. Bulos, if ever. Uh. <laughs> so, that's what I have to say. We're extremely social. Everybody go on your phones right now, like Legal Logic on every platform, like Jane Van Injury, and the idea of this is not to make me into a celebrity. The idea is for us to have outlets um, for people to actually have access to legal information that we're publishing, which is, I consider, quality content. Because we're not just putting out um, just random things of me talking about you know, Ty Lopez, we're putting out guides, we're putting out videos, and I'm kind of you know, trying to demystify what it's like to get a trademark. You know, why, why you should incorporate versus not. These are things that you guys need to know as, as entrepreneurs. Thank you for your time. I love these events so much. Um, first of all, JMSB, some of the best energy, and they are putting together these amazing events that actually give people real content, practical advice from people who've been there and done it, some people who failed, some people who've succeeded, and people like me who are in the middle, who are trying to do it, who are trying to make a reputation, a name for themselves. So I'm always humbled to be part of these events. I love to contribute, I love to be as honest as possible. Q&A session today was great, guys. Grilling me with honest stuff, keeping me completely honest and real. So thank you for the opportunity, JMSB. Always have a place in my heart.